this is contrary, by the way, to much of the American evangelical experience. We tend to think that persecution is some kind of anomaly in the Christian life. It's not. Hey guys, welcome to Barino Babs. I'm your host, Vali Chikuni. Today, we'll be going through the highlights of Phil Johnson's message at the Shepherds Conference. Love the theme of this year's conference, Truth Triumphs, which of course, that is the victorious end note of biblical eschatology. Truth will defeat every lie and every false ideology. Christ wins, righteousness prevails, evil is defeated forever, virtue is eternally vindicated, and Christ is enthroned as Lord of all, and God is endlessly glorified. And no matter what eschatological scheme you favor, if you are a true believer, you affirm that much. Christ, who is the truth and the life, will be absolutely victorious in the end. Yes, so uh, that's how uh, he started it. I thought that was just a powerful, yes, uh, truth triumphs and he already just put it out there no matter what your eschatological view that you hold just know that truth will triumph yes over five thousand pastors everybody i'm sure there they have different views on eschatology but everybody does agree that yes truth will triumph and jesus is king jesus definitely reigns so phil johnson preached from uh lsb I'm actually liking uh, the LSB translation. I think it's good, it's good, but you know, I like it. So he preached from there. He did share the just the history of suffering throughout um, the early church. And I thought that was, uh, you know, quite an eye opening. And let's just listen in to what he had to say. He always punctuates the mention of his advers adversity with, with this powerful proclamation of triumph. Here in 2 Corinthians 2, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. In chapter 4, afflicted but not crushed, perplexed but not despairing. Again in chapter 7, immediately before he says in verse 5, we were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within. Just before that he says, verse 4, as emphatically as possible, I am overflowing with joy in all our affliction. And that's how Christians are supposed to live always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life and the triumph of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. And for the Christian, there is this perpetual triumph, even in affliction and persecution. Triumph through persecution? That's actually the theme of the passage they've assigned me this year. 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 19. One thing that I did like of uh, um, Phil Johnson's message just how he compared uh, the writings of Peter and Paul and this idea of like, okay, you know, Peter and Paul are at odds with one another, but they're all, you know, both of them just writing about suffering and Christian suffering is not a bad thing. It is to be expected because uh, that's how we get our sanctification. That's how we are even uh, tr Christ is triumphant whenever we are going through persecution, whenever we are going through suffering. And we don't always associate suffering with triumph. I'm like, okay, <laughs> do we need to get baptized again? <laughs> so let's listen in to some more of uh, the preaching. And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God must entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing good. Eight verses, and notice every one of them mentions afflictions of some kind. This passage is full of words that evoke the idea of human suffering. Four times in the English versions, you have some variant of the word suffering. And he also mentions testing, trials, insults, difficulty, and judgment. But the word he doesn't use is persecution. And yet, it's obvious from the context that the main kind of suffering he's talking about here is persecution. Suffering for righteousness sake. Bearing insults and attacks, verse 16. Suffering as a Christian. So when these guys were preaching, it's like you're drinking water from the fire hose. It's just information, 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 okay? 
And uh, one thing that I did enjoy that Phil Johnson brought up was just like just um, like I shared with you about the history. So I want you guys to take a listen because like, you know, I don't want to uh, add in because I might forget something. In order to deflect the public wrath away from himself, Nero blamed Christians for starting the fire. The Roman Gentiles generally held all of the Jewish people in contempt. There had been tension between Rome and Judea going back before the time of Christ's birth. And Rome, in fact, at this time, was already gathering its military might for a campaign that ultimately would result in the total destruction of the city of Jerusalem. In fact, less than six years after the great fire of Rome, Titus Vespasian would reduce the temple in Jerusalem to rubble. It's never been rebuilt to this day. The Roman army pillaged everything that had any value in Jerusalem and left the entire city just a pile of smoldering ruins. So anti-Semitism was a, a strong undercurrent in pagan Roman society. And because the earliest Christians were all Jewish, Rome had always been a place where hostility to the Christians in particular festered just under the surface. And Roman officials you know, regarded the Christians as secretive, dangerous kind of misfits and even criminals. Can you believe it that once upon a time that Christians were viewed as the, as the weirdos in that regard, right? Thinking that they're the ones who are atheists and how things have changed throughout history. So I thought this was uh, a very interesting, um, just making the scriptures so real. So I don't know if I already mentioned to you guys, he was preaching from First Peter 5, and he did uh, share quite a few, uh, a different number of takes, but all centered in, in uh, about suffering. He also talked about uh, Philippians as well. So let's listen in to this history of how things were viewed during Nero. And what he said, like, okay, the temple was never re rebuilt. Well, the temple was never rebuilt up until this day. Christians talking about the Lord's table, many of them concluded that the Christians were practicing cannibalism. The Christians were typically regarded as atheists because they refused to worship the pantheon of Roman gods. And they were also accused of incest because they called one another brother and sister and spoke of being united together in one body. And the depraved pagan ears interpreted all of that in the most sinister possible way. So there was this comparatively tiny community of believers in Rome, but Roman officials regarded them as a sort of dangerous fringe sect of Jewish extremists. So Nero's lie intensified the public's contempt for Christianity. And the whole catalog of lies and false speculations about Christians circulated starting in Rome, but went throughout the whole Roman Empire, first as rumors, then as urban myths, and finally the, these false tales became the dominant narrative about Christianity. And that's why Christians in first century Rome were typically looked upon with deep distrust and dislike, because most of the pagan public literally regarded Christians as criminals. And all of this made Christians an easy scapegoat when Nero needed one for the, to explain the great fire. And under his authority, Roman officials began to sanction and participate in the harshest forms of persecution against Christians. Tacitus, who, who lived in that era, is the secular historian who recorded that Nero would bind Christians in thick wrappings of sackcloth and then tie them to poles, coat them with tar and oil, and set them ablaze, and he used them like candles to light his garden parties. He also crucified believers. Peter was ultimately one of Nero's victims, probably not very long after Peter wrote this epistle. Nero also put Christians in the gladiatorial arenas to be eaten by wild animals for the entertainment of crowds. So can you imagine that's the history uh, of Christianity? And it's just like, wow. Now, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. Now, nobody wants to suffer, but just to be hearing people, uh, this is what people went through throughout history. And that's why just like, oh, you know, Caesar is not like, okay, you know, but they'll be like, no, Jesus is God. Jesus is king. will be like, uh, uh that statement will cost you life. Phil Johnson did share more on the issue of suffering. And I was so happy the way he was just able to tie things that happen in history and the things that Peter is actually writing, that we do have the writings today in the scriptures. I was just like, man, the word of God is amazing. So let's listen in to how he just, you know, 
connected everything together, man. We need to be reading our Bibles for sure, okay? Honestly say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. And Peter wants to remind these scattered saints of that blessed beatitude. He sums up the message in our passage. And so now I, I want to look at this passage point by point. I see five imperatives that are either stated or implied in these eight verses, and I want to point them out to you. Five simple imperatives. The first is this, be ready. Be ready. Verse 12, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. This is contrary, by the way, to much of the American evangelical experience. We tend to think that persecution is some kind of anomaly in the Christian life. It's not. It's what normal Christians have always experienced. It, this is what is normal. As long as we live in this world as strangers and aliens, we are citizens of heaven, we are slaves of Christ, and none of that fits neatly into the hierarchy of Earth's social pecking order. It's not supposed to. Again, as Paul said to Timothy, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Yeah, all those who desire to live godly lives will be persecuted. So he did have, uh, I think, six of uh, the application points that he shared. So the first one was like, yeah, okay, be ready. Okay, so all this is coming from First Peter uh, 5. I think, you know, he just uh, tackled the entire chapter, just uh, getting things from there. So it's like, you know, be ready. Suffering is normal, okay? We don't tend to think that suffering is normal. Then he talked about uh, be glad. Whenever that suffering is coming, you should just be glad. <laughs> I'm like, okay, who wants to be glad about suffering? Okay, then he called... Um, talked about we got to be uh, be steadfast we got to be be steadfast then uh he talked about we need to be we got to be humble and the fifth point he talked about we have to be faithful and man i was just like man you know <laughs> lord jesus come <laughs> So let's see, will I be able to get the scripture? Okay, so this is uh, the text that he was going through, right? First Peter 5, okay? Um, I mean, we don't have to go all the way at the top, okay? I'll just start from 6, okay? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to, dev to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced uh, throughout the world. Okay? Are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. I was just like, yes. We need to be reminded of such things. Because we always think like, okay, you are just the, uh, the only one, right? And even the same, um, he, he even talked more. Uh, let's share this at the beginning, right? First Peter 5 1. So I exalt elders among you as fellow elders, witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. So, yes, whenever we are suffering, like you know, that you know, it's, it's showing that this is, um, just I'm just reading it, okay? Because <laughs> I, I don't want to uh, say something that's not true. Okay, I exhort elders among you as fair elders and witness of the suffering of Christ as well as partakers in the glory that is going to be revealed. So throughout our suffering, the glory is going to be revealed. I was just like, oh, okay, that's nice, you know? Shepherd the flock the whole nine years. And this is just fits perfectly because this is um, the shepherd's conference. Follow the logic of these imperatives. Be ready, be glad, be steadfast. Number four, be humble. Persecution is not only a blessing, it's also a tool by which God proves and purifies and strengthens the church. And that's what Peter means by the word judgment in verse 17. What he has in mind might entail an element of fatherly discipline, but it doesn't imply even a hint of condemnation. Romans 8, 1, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But nevertheless, there is a need for testing and strengthening and even correcting the church. 
And the church is what Peter means when he speaks of the household of God. Therefore, verse 17, is time for judgment to begin with the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Now, what does this mean? It is with difficulty that the righteous is saved. Understand, he is not suggesting that God has a hard time saving us. Though, in all candor, as I peer into my own heart, I have to confess to my shame that I haven't always made it easy for the Spirit of God to conform me to Christ's likeness. But that's not what Peter's saying here. He's saying that if life is hard for the redeemed, if honoring Christ and following him always entails taking up a cross and suffering, if it always subjects the saints to persecution and anguish and hardships and even death at the hands of the wicked, if it's that bad for us, how much more severe will God's final judgment be for the godless man and the sinner? And if you realize all of that, what should that compel you to do? It should compel you to be humble and sober-minded and zealous for the salvation of the lost. That was Pastor Phil Johnson, and he did give a very good message. I did like how he closed his message, so I uh, want you guys to also listen to how the message ended. Okay, so... Here is uh, Pastor Phil, closing remarks at the Shepherd's Conference. Just leave it at that. Be faithful. As Jesus said to the church at Smyrna, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful, brethren. And let me say one other thing in closing. There is nothing elegant or impressive about suffering persecution. I mean, even if you follow all five of these imperatives, it won't win you many accolades. Paul suffered so much that no one but Luke even wanted to be closely associated with him anymore. And in fact, suffering itself is a powerful reminder that we should never regard the Christian faith purely or even predominantly as an academic matter. It's not merely an academic matter. Yeah, ever since the Puritan era ended, the quest for academic respectability and, and an illicit craving for academic honors and intellectual status has actually undermined the faith and weakened the testimony of the church. On the other hand, persecution, if it's well received, is a powerful, practical affirmation and an unanswerable testimony to the world that our faith is real, that the gospel is true, that heaven's glory will ultimately triumph over all the evils of this world. May God give us grace no longer to live in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Let's pray. How about that? How about that? That's how he closed his message. Okay. Um, truth, uh, truth will always triumph. Our faith is real. The gospel is true. So whatever we are going through as Christians, even in the midst of suffering, we should always remember that truth triumphs. So uh, that was a good message that uh, Phil Johnson gave to the men gathered at the Shepherds Conference. All right, guys, stay tuned. More coming this week. Until next time, remember to be in the now.